Thank you very much for coming. I want to say thank you to the cousin of my shoe for being here and his wife. I'm really pleased to see them. To all the friends that I know, to Don for bringing people that he knows, and to Sean for the hard work on my slides. He's seen my slides before. Thank you. He's seen my slides before when he said my slides weren't very good and he rewrote them and I'm happy. We'll see how we go. Okay. I'm a plastic surgeon and unfortunately you can't see this, but it's not critical because you know who I am. And this is a concise view of cosmetic surgery, right? Because I'm a plastic surgeon, breast reconstruction, and something about diet. And I'll explain to you why a plastic surgeon is talking about diet a little bit later on. I'm going to flash through the plastic surgeon because that's important to me, right? Because this is what we need to know. Two broad subdivisions in plastic surgery, reconstructive surgery and cosmetic surgery. Reconstructive surgery is what happens when people are involved in car accidents or they have cancer or they have some kind of need for reconstruction. The word plastic surgery comes from the Greek word plastikos, to repair or to restore. It's got nothing to do with plastic, although we sometimes we do use synthetic materials. What happens is you, you've got to have good function, because if you make a beautiful nose and you can't breathe through it, it's a complete waste of time. So the two things go hand in hand. So the next one, please. There's a thing called informed consent. When I operate on patients, then I say to them, it's absolutely critical. These are the critical points you need to know. Realistic achievable goal, cosmetic surgery improvement, not perfection. The practice of medicine and surgery are inexact, and no reputable physician should ever guarantee or, or warranty a result. The next one I can't see. Let me see what it says here. Do you okay. not proceed Don't proceed with the surgery you know, unless you know exactly what you're doing. Cosmetic surgery is about perceived desire for improvement in quality, but not the quantity of life. Therefore, it's essential that you know exactly what you're doing because unnecessary surgery. Next one, please. All surgery is exactly the same. There's a cut that produces a scar, and I tell all my patients it's not invisible. Mending, there's scars. The secret is how to hide them. There's always pain, bruising, swelling, there's the risk of infection, and there's sometimes bleeding. And then, well, there is bleeding, but the critical thing is that one's got to control that. And I talk to my patients about all the medicines and drugs and pills they shouldn't be taking if they're going to have the surgery. So we don't have a problem with that because the bleeding is a big thing that can disturb surgery. And then the specific thing is the specific areas being treated that responds in a different way. Next one, please. Okay. The scope of it, you can operate on, on any area from here downwards if you think that you can improve it and if the patient really wants it. And it's a realistic request. Next one, please. Okay. Four main, this is basic surgery and unfortunately these are not going to show up well in this light. But there are four main subjects of the face. There's the forehead and eyebrows. They're the eyes, the central third of the face, which goes from here in the middle like this, because they're the two, the outer thirds. And a classic face that doesn't fix the central third and get rid of these heavy nasolabial folds, which one needs to correct. Then there's the lower face and neck. A good facelift must produce a perfect jawline and neck. This is a technical exercise and you pay for what you get. One often sees facelifts that have been done, and the face is kind of tight from here sideways, very little over here, and an uncorrected neck. And that's just no good. It's too fast. Okay. There are multiple surgical techniques. Okay. The earliest kind of face that was skin only, where you make incisions, you put the skin, they didn't last a long time. Then there's skin and smas. The smas is like a stocking which is underneath the muscle. And what you do, you tighten the stocking and then you lay the skin back down on that so that you don't get a windswept appearance. Then there's a deep plane lift where you pick up the skin and that stocking in one go and you put it back together. Then there's a subperiosteal facelift and I've done quite a few of those and I'll show you some of the people that I've done them on. This is an incision which is inside the mouth and across the top of the head. And what you do is you pick the periosteum, which is the covering of the bone, off and you lift the whole thing in one piece. What that does is produces dramatic results which can last 20 or 25 years. Then there are procedures that fill the deflated face because as you age, not only do things come down, but you lose subcutaneous fat. So that you, you're aging in two directions. Also, your bones shrink a little bit, so you need to fill up the, the face which has come down. These are procedures which are taking on enormously now because there are a lot of people doing them. There are people called cosmetic surgeons. There are GPs. There are dermatologists. Anybody who wants to get into cosmetic surgery, cosmetic medicine, can start doing this. 
it's not really a surgical procedure, and so it doesn't last a hell of a long time, and it's variable. And some people inject fat, and fat injection is obviously the ideal, but it also doesn't last a hell of a long time. Then there are procedures that actively treat aging skin, like lasers and sand and chemical peels, and then other medical interventions, the best one, which everybody knows about, is Botox, which is really great stuff. Next one, please. Okay, here's some examples of facelifts. I'm sorry it's not dark enough yet, but that's out of my control. This is a lady who had a facelift. This is a full facelift. This is one that I did quite a long time ago. She's had her upper and lower lids done. I never touched her eyebrows because her eyebrows are in a good position. She's had a nasolabial fold effaced and taken out, and she's had her neck corrected. And if you don't get a good neck and a jawline, it's a complete waste of time. And that's a good result. And that kind of result should last somewhere between 7 and 10 years. The correct time to do a facelift is 45 to 55, some people before, some people after. This. Next one, please. There's a facelift that I did. And I don't know if everybody understands Afrikaans, but the, this patient said to me, by like your doctor, you'd make prachtige mark. And that's in fact what I think. She looks beautiful. It's made a massive difference to her. So, next one, please. This is a 74-year-old lady who is a very active golfer, and the only thing she didn't like was her neck. And she said, well, please correct my neck, but don't make me look like a poppy, whatever that is. So I said, fine, we'll do that for you. And her neck has been corrected, and what that involves is making a cut underneath the chin, doing a facelift incision, because you can't do the neck in isolation, and then doing a, a muscle plication, where you take these two muscles, and you sew them together in the midline like that, and then you put a stitch here, which goes around that like this, and you get that result. And when the muscles are tight, you can then lay the skin back and get this kind of result. Next one, please. This occasion got a subperiosteal facelift. This is the cut inside the mouth and over the top of the head. And I did this um, years ago. And this procedure was done because she's got what's called a scleral show. That's white underneath the eyes, and it's because of not of this brilliant blepharoplasty, lower eyelid procedure, which is very, a very common operation. And the way it's done commonly produces this defect, which can be seen easily by somebody who knows what they're looking for. But it gives a little piece of white underneath the iris. So that, the way to correct that is by doing a subperiosteal facelift over the top, inside the mouth, down to the bone. And what you do is you pick up the little tendon here, which fixes the corner of the eye on the bone, so you can do that to it and pick it up. And it lasts, as I said to you, an incredibly long time, and it's a beautiful procedure. What I've also done to her is I've done that muscle procedure in the center of the neck, so that's a good line. Next one, please. This is another lady, but she's got an even more exaggerated form of this problem. It's called an anti-Mongolian slant, where the eyelids slope down like that. And the only way to correct that is to go inside the mouth, move the tendon. That's what I do. Next one, please. This is a woman who had a facelift in the UK, and you can see this is this is her post, this is you know a year or six months or whatever it is after her facelift. And you can see that she's got no correction of her neck, and they are corrected her neck for her. But the reason that I did the superiosteal facelift on her, the next slide please, is that she'd had that done to her eyes, and her eyes looked like this. Because whoever did to her took much too much skin out of her eyes. And what she had is she got a thing called ectropion, where the lids hang open. The only way to fix that is to take this piece of skin, put a skin graft in, and then you've got a permanent skin graft over here, which is a totally different color and texture. And that's a very unsightly thing to do. So I said to the other alternative to this is to do something else to facelift, go inside the mouth, over the top of the head, and then you lift the periosteum and that tendon, and you can pull everything back into its right position. Because as you age, one of the things that happens and more in men than in women, not only does the eyelid get becoming redundant in this direction, it also becomes redundant in this direction. So there's this thing called a snap test, where you take the eyelid like this, and you put it back, and if you are a man, and you're over 40, when you put it back like this, it just slowly goes back like that. But if you have a, a, a child or a young woman, and you do this, it just goes bang, right? And this is a, quite a dangerous thing to do, eyelid surgery on old people without understanding the problem of the washing line, which is instead of tight, it's now loose. Now you cut the skin out, and then the lid hangs. So one's got to be very careful about this. Next, please. This is a woman who had the modern equivalent, a more recent equivalent, of a subperiosteal lift cut over the top of the head inside the mouth. And this is called a max lift. 
and was described by a Belgian surgeon pretty recently. And max lift is short for minimal access cranial suspension. It's got a cut which goes here. Not here, because if you do this and you lift the skin, progressively the side bone starts going further back. And then you get a big bald area in front of here which you can't correct and everybody can see that it's very unsightly. So you go zigzagging in front of the hairline like this, beveling the incision so the hair will then grow through the incision. And then you go down in front of the ear, back into the hairline over there. And what you then do is you put a stitch through a hard piece of gristle that everyone's got over the muscle over here. And you go in and out, in and out, in and out, and you make a loop that comes back there, and you come out there again. You make another loop that goes like this. And you pull these two back, like this and like that. It's a very quick, very simple procedure, and it gives dramatic results. And it can be done under local anesthesia, and in Europe and the United States as an outpatient procedure. But I'm much more comfortable, you know, I do it under local, keep the patients overnight, then I can go see them afterwards and say that they're well. Next one, please. This is what you looked like before, that's an after. If it was darker, it would look better, but anyway, that's what it looks like. Another one, please. There's another, this is the patient who had a previous facelift as well, uncorrected neck. The scar, you can't see it here, ran straight down in front of the ear, which is a bad giveaway for a bad facelift. The inner lobe was attached to the side of the face like this and pulled forwards. It's called a pixie lobe, and that's another bad mark of bad facelift. And the incision went underneath the hairline like that, so she really couldn't put her hair up. So there's another indication of bad facelift. So you essentially you pay for what you get. Now, I could have done this up there, I on her, but I did that max lift on her. This thing described by the Belgian, because it's quick, and it's easy, and it's, it doesn't have the downtime of this thing which goes across the top of the head and inside the mouth. But there are still indications for that. Next one, please. This is before, and this is after. This is an old woman, this is a young woman. Next one, please. This is a man who didn't like his neck. He said he didn't want me to touch his face too much, but you can't just do the neck. Because if you do the neck only, and you, it piles up in front of the ear, you do need to take something off in front of the face. So that's what I did. Next one, please. You can see from the side. He's got his Adam's apple back, and that whole <laughs> thing has disappeared, and the jowls, and the whole trip. Thank you. Next one, please. These are noses. This is surgery of small bits and pieces. It's the most complex of all surgery that plastic surgeons do, because just a millimeter or two can make a difference. This is an interesting nose. It's called... It's the same patient all the way along here. She's got a, a tip which is split in the middle. The two cartilages are separated. It's very long, a long nose. It's called a Pinocchio nose. It's also too wide. If you drop a line from here to there, these little things are too wide. So she has multiple